What is going on, everyone? I am Wesley Shoemaker, joined by Keenan Cummings on another episode of the WestVirginiaSports.com podcast. The countdown is officially on, and it's officially heating up if you are around the West Virginia football program, as they are under two weeks until kickoff of the 2024 regular season. And with that came their second scrimmage on Saturday. So we're going to get right into that. So, Keenan, we are now... Two-thirds of the way through this thing, almost done, entering the last week of fall camp as school in Morgantown and at WVU starts this week. So we had our second scrimmage. Obviously, it was closed to public viewing, including our viewing, but we did hear from head coach Neil Brown after the scrimmage, and he talked about a lot of things of what he liked, what he didn't like, and everything in between. So just what's something that stood out to you and your kind of overall takeaways from what you heard from Neil yesterday? I think we're at that point of fall camp, and Neil kind of touched on this a little bit yesterday. Uh, you know, he's agitated. The team's agitated. You know, it's it's just you're short fuse at this point. So the smallest things uh, are going to be something that gets critiqued a little bit because you're at this point where you, know, you got to gear up. You know, you're, you're going to play Penn State soon. Uh, this, this this is right around the corner now. Um, so you got to kind of be a little bit better. You know, Neil talked about the standard. You know, this that they did it wasn't terrible yesterday is the way he referenced it. it. It wasn't something that, you know, they're going to hang in a museum either. So he wasn't really happy about a lot of things. Now, some players he was. He didn't really specify on some of the things. You know, he tried to edge it out of him a little bit, but he m- mostly talked about execution and how this is a veteran team. You know, they need to be better. He went down and kind of touched on all of it. You know, they ran about a, a little bit over 100 plays. He did all their core special team stuff. They had a Big 12 officiating crew there. So it was really a game-like situation. Gotten a lot of, uh, you know, goal line work, red zone work, opening drive, third and fourth down periods, all this different stuff that, you know, they could work in film. And these scrimmages, you know, it's really a personnel-driven type thing. You know, they're going to look at, you know, you watch it on first view. And th- you know, this happens a lot in football. You know, you'll watch it on first view and think it was great or think it was bad. And then you kind of t- go back, watch the film, and you'll find out a lot more. And I think that that process started after we met with Mil- Neil yesterday. It, it's going to continue over the next couple of days. And that's when you're going to start to see him really pare down, you know, where where guys fit in, you know, who's going to play, who's not going to play. Um, I do think it was telling that, you know, he wasn't as excited because he admitted that, you know, this team had been going upward, it's really an upward trajectory the last three or four practices, and they fell short, you know, in some key areas that that they wanted, you know, they really wanted them to succeed in. And I think that's some of that a little bit is gamesmanship out of Brown. You know, you don't want your p- players reading press clippings, getting too excited this time of year. You know, there's a lot of work left, even with fall camp, you know, coming, coming to a close here soon. But another, another part of it, too, I think he was a little frustrated just with how some things went, you could tell it, it wasn't. He wasn't as uh, bubbly as he is sometimes. Uh, you could tell that fall camp's starting to wear on him in a little bit, and I think that's only natural this time of the year. Yeah, I know that this time last week, everyone knew what this week would entail for West Virginia. They they branded it as the hardest week of fall camp, and it seems like it certainly was. They said that they were going to be physical throughout the week, and they were physical once again on Saturday. I think they went, as you said, over 100 plays. And so that's not easy on a group. And I think that they also – what Neil said is they really wanted to challenge these guys and get into them, right? I think the biggest takeaway for me was yesterday wasn't about judging this team overall. It was about judging the depth of this team. As as he stated, he held Garrett Green back. He held some of those top guys back on both sides of the ball, just because he wanted to see how those guys beneath him, beneath them, excuse me, will play. Because at the end of the day, when you get into the thick of things in October and November, it's not about always how your top five, top seven guys will play. It's about how those guys will fill in elsewhere. And I think that's where the really challenging thing was. And I think that's also, as he stated, what's going to have to be the big decision of. Were the guys that were doing things that he might not have liked, are they going to be guys that are contenders to play or are they going to be guys that won't play? And I think that's the biggest kind of wait and see area of what we are in right now because we are just unsure of what he sees, what the coaching staff is seeing, and specifically with guys and things like that. But going back to – let's start here on the defensive side of the ball. He said things started off well for them, but over time he – 
wasn't really happy, but part of that was the challenge he put them under. What What's kind of your guess of to how he's viewing this defense overall, just because there's been so much turnover, especially on that back end. And there's also still though, some names, especially on that defensive line that returned this year. Yeah. I think that his, his comments were more tailored to, you know, that once they really challenged him, those guys were out there playing a lot of snaps yesterday and things kind of tailed off a little bit and you'll have that, but they wanted to put him in, like you mentioned earlier, put him in tough spots, you know, see how they respond. There are some spots on that defense right now that, really still need to have some question marks, especially at safety. You know, you know Anthony Wilson's going to be a starter, but they've held him back. You know, he was a little banged up. They want to see what they got behind him with Tarnu and some of those other guys in, in, in the back end, kind of see where they fit. You know, Jaheim Joseph, a, a transfer that they liked a lot from Northwestern, a versatility guy. Is he going to be able to help them? And that's really what this is about. You know, when you have a veteran football team, when you have a lot of guys returning, there aren't a lot of – question marks with the first group it's that second third you know what guys you can be able to depend on if you have an injury because we've talked about this before wesley they had an injury last year in the secondary and it just it, it killed them they truly did not have the personnel to move around mix and match you need to find you need to be sure that you can do that this year and you know we talk about depth and coaches talk about depth and you can talk about depth all you want it doesn't matter if it actually can't show itself in a game uh, you got to be able to trust guys. You got to be able to put guys in situations where they're uncomfortable and see how they respond. And that's what fall camp's for. You know, you find these things out before you're just throwing throwing guys in there in live situations. You know, you try to simulate game like situations. Try try to put them in as much pressure kind of pressure cooker situations as you can, so you know what you have when the bullets actually start flying. And I think that that is what they're trying to do. Uh, that that's what they're trying to accomplish. I think for the most part, it's been. Pretty good for the defense. I think this defense has a chance to surprise people. And you look at them, they look different. We've talked about this a lot. They look different. They're bigger. They're faster. They're stronger. Now you got to prove it. And I think that that's where they're at. You know, are they going to be able to prove this consistently? Because if they can, maybe this defense really surprises some people. If they can't, you're going to have a lot of the same questions you had last year at times. Yeah. And I think to your point, let's go back. Let's just go to the secondary to, to start for me. It's that – because of let's just take last year and how they didn't have a lot of depth. I feel like there's a level of hesitancy with Neil and with some of these coaches of kind of reaching into that depth because in the past when they've tried to reach into that depth, it's burned them in a sense because it just hasn't been there. And so while I get that they're saying that there's bodies there, it's hard for them to look past what's happened in the past of we haven't had depth and it hasn't worked. And I think that's one of the kind of, big things to see is how quickly will they go to that depth if something goes wrong or if a guy isn't playing as well as they expected him to, especially early because we, as we've talked about, there's, there's no easing into this thing, but also how much leash, let's say, do some of these transfers have if they are stacked up close to each other when decisions are made. And I think that's, one thing that I just kind of maybe feel from Neil is a little bit of hesitancy just because not all of this has worked to plan in the past. Yeah, and I think that that's why you go out and you get six transfers to, for your secondary. You want older, you want more experienced guys, and you got to hope they hit. For the most part, you know, one year they, they miss badly in the secondary when it comes to bringing guys in. Other than that, it's hard to argue with some of the guys they brought in. The problem has been – behind those guys uh, you know which one of these guys I think at corner you feel pretty good about the two guys uh Garnett Hall Garnett Hollis and uh Aiden Garns I think that all intense purposes I think that's going to be your two starting cornerbacks week one uh and then behind them you know do you feel good there safety you know behind Anthony Wilson uh, you know behind some of these other guys they got in the back end which guys are going to emerge because you'd like to play Aubrey Burks in that I don't want to say full spear role, but you want him to be able to move around and showcase his versatility instead of just putting him in the back end. Closer to the line of scrimmage, scrimmage really kind of fits his profile more. And if you have someone that can step in, you know, and play where he would be playing at Cat, you know, it, it's going to help a lot. So I think that it, when you look at how this thing's going to come together, for me, the biggest question by far is the secondary, even with what they've what the, what they've addressed. I feel good about the defensive line. You know, some of those guys need to prove themselves. Linebacker, pretty similar. I think that they have a good group. This is the best group physically 
really probably since I've been covering the team, just from a physical a- aspect and as deep as they are, they're five deep at least at linebacker right now, inside linebacker. So I feel good there. I like the Spurs, the edge rushers. I really like the corners, honestly. It, it's more the safeties. I want to see, you know, how that group – because that – I mean, Neil mentioned it yesterday. He pointed that position out specifically. You know, they need to see which one of those guys are going to step up. They went out and got veterans, and now those guys have to play like veterans. And I, I think to your point, especially about – Aubrey Burke specifically is that because they want him closer to the line of scrimmage and they don't want him to have to play that safety position, but how quick will they maybe say, okay, Aubrey, go give us some snaps back there because guys aren't performing to the level that they are expecting them to. And therefore, how does that change things schematically and total as defense? Cause if you move Aubrey from one spot, how does that, how do guys shift elsewhere? And so I think that's something also to keep an eye on as we get into week one, week two, week three of the season of, if guys are not performing like they are expected to, and if it's a problem that is not just from one, but from two, three, four of those guys, then what do they do schematically that might switch things up just because Aubrey's a guy that's proven himself back there before. And so if there's a level as, as we say, like these coaches want to be comfortable, they've said that they want to be comfortable with the guys in the game. And if, if they're, if that, if they're most comfortable with Aubrey Burks playing that, that safety spot, then that's what they might have to do depending on how these guys perform. But obviously, to their credit, they're still 13 days away. They still have a little bit of time, but that clock is ticking and it's staring them right in the face if they want to figure things out. Let's go to the offensive side of the ball uh, really quickly. Obviously, one thing that stood out to me was Preston Fox's name seems to keep getting mentioned over and Every over and over time, again. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> Yeah, um, not only as a punt returner, but this time as a wide receiver. I know in the first scrimmage they posted a clip of him making a pretty good catch down the middle, and it just seems like when the ball finds him, it's not an easy catch ever, and it seems like he's always under duress, and he's always somehow coming out of it. Maybe his helmet looks a little sideways, and his shoulder pads are crooked, but like he always has the ball in his hands, and he, he, he's been called Mr. Reliable, and he seems to be doing that. So that's been the biggest thing for me is obviously in a, a room full of wide receivers that we're trying to figure out who's going to play where and who's going to get the majority of the snaps. That little guy, old Preston Fox, Mr. Punt Returner, Morgantown native, is seems to be working his way into the fold. The Honda Accord, yeah, uh, as <laughs> Bilal Marshall always refers to him as, the just dependable guy. And you're not – I mean, you're not wrong. I mean, everybody. It's not just Neil. You know, Chad Scott mentioned, you know, when in doubt, find P. Fox. You know, it's that – he has been, uh, and from all intents and purposes, everything I've heard, you know, from people about how things have gone as well outside just the coaches is he's been the guy. You know, he's been a guy that gets open. He makes catch. You saw it last year. You know, when he he made some big catches for this football team. Now he's a year older, a year stronger. And another name, Hudson Clement, has played a very, very, very good camp. You know, I think that you're feeling a lot better about that wide receiver room overall. And, and you know, this team's going to run the football. We all know that. Can the wide receivers beat press coverage? Can they win in those situations? If they can do that. Well, can and, they hold on to the ball too? Can they, can yeah. when the ball gets hit to their hands or in the catch radius, can they make the catch? Yes. Can they make those tight contested catches when DBs want to come up on them, bump them? Because last year it, it wasn't, an, it was more an issue of strength than anything. And now this year, you're, you're hoping that that's, that's resolved itself naturally, you know, through another year of strength and conditioning. If you can win in those situations and, and you can consistently win in those situations, this offense goes from, you know, pretty good at the end of last year to potentially elite if, if you can make those jumps. So I think that that's the question for me. Offensively, you know this team is going to be able to run the football. Yes, I know they lost some pieces up front, but they have experienced guys stepping in. I think that they're going to be okay there. They're going to be able to run the football. What Garrett Green's able to do, he just brings a different dimension. You know, you have to account account for him at all times. It's going to be hard to stop him from running the ball. But can they win in those situations where they have to throw the ball or when teams are basically daring them to throw the ball, can they make them pay? And I think the message, if you talk to the coaches, you talk to the players, you know, do it. Zero us. You know, do it. We'll see what happens this year. And I think if if that translates on the field, you got to be pretty excited about what this offense can be. Yeah, I think the as we've as, as we've said before, right? They went out to the portal to try and get those bigger physical receivers and they did that. But they also need those littler guys, those speed guys to be able to win as well because it's it's not just one guy that's going to be able to elevate that. It's going to be have the whole group in total and they can scheme things to try and get them open. 
But as you said, if if you if you look down the line and it's one on one coverage and you have a, a Mountaineer receiver versus an opposing DB and you know they're bringing it and you know you're going to throw the ball to him, it's can you have the trust that he will win that battle? But it's kind of shifting over to the tight end position, one name we just haven't heard at all until yesterday, Jack Samarco, true freshman tight end. Just give me your thoughts on him. I, I thought it was a little surprising that in the tight end room that they return and obviously Cole Taylor, Traylon Davis there, like we know what we have, what West Virginia has there. It's just a matter of, Oh, this is seems new and flashy. Like obviously just his name being mentioned when we haven't heard it all year. Yeah. I've, I've made some mention of just how big the kid is. Now he is big. Like he stands out physically. Um, that's kind of, I guess what they want moving forward. There's big body tight ends, but yeah, that surprised me a little bit. He's making a move, you know, true freshman. You don't usually hear true freshman tight ends making a move in their first fall camp. Now he had the benefit of the spring, which helps you, but I'll be interested to see how that fits in because you got three guys already there. I wonder if he's going to be that third, fourth guy because you, you you know you've got the two proven guys, then you got Jen Ross, then him. So I think the most exciting thing for me is it, if you're a member of our Blue Lot Message Board, I swear tight ends almost a dirty word to some people. You know West Virginia's why are they recruiting all these tight ends? Why 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 are there so many tight ends on this roster? You're starting to see why now. You know they're using a lot more two tight end looks. You know, they're using tight ends on a lot of things, and it makes so many things happen in the run and pass game that it really opens some things up. I mean, a lot of people think that yeah, using a tight end means he's got to catch 100 passes. No, no, there's a lot more to it. And I think that – I think Cole Taylor's going to have a better year if he stays healthy than he did last year. But just all the things they were able to do with those guys last year opens up so many things. And I think that Jackson Marco, they have big plans for him in the future. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll realize itself this year. I think it's more one of those guys that's just playing well at this time because it's hard. It really is hard. It's a physical position. It's basically kind of like an extension of an offensive tackle that can run and catch. So it, it's hard. But I do think that in the future, I'm excited for him too. I think that you look at how big the kid is, how well he moves at his size, and it'll be interesting to see where he fits into the picture. Yeah, and Neil mentioned this with not just him, but with just freshmen in general, that if they're ready to play, they're going to play. And I think that's a little bit change in tone from what we've heard in the past where they've kind of held guys back when they probably could have inserted them maybe. But especially on special teams, right, you don't want to have your top-tier guys have to go out there and play those extra snaps in some cases. And so a guy like Jackson Marco, he might fit in on special teams or similar guys of his profile that they're not really – proving enough to possibly get on the field just because there's a lot of guys in front of him at that at those positions, but at least getting on the field in the sense of they're able to help this team win in other areas, specifically on special teams. Yeah, and you can't anymore. I mean, you can't set around. If you do, you run the risk of losing guys. Um, if they can play, if they can make a contribute somewhere, you better get them in the game. Uh, now, now, a lot of people always think that means – you know, playing offense, defense, it does not. You know, a lot of freshmen are going to play special teams. West Virginia likes to put some of their starters on special teams too. So you have a good mix there. And I think that that's going to be the future of college football because if you're not playing them, somebody else out there will. And that's why you see a lot of the movement in college football nowadays because it's just a different game. You know, kids don't want to wait two, three years before they see the field. It just They just don't. Yeah, on the topic of special teams, too, I know Jeff Coons, he met with the media this week, special teams coach, and the the two things really stood out to me. First thing is kind of an overall is an overall team thing of how Neil Brown really tries to get into the weeds of understanding how five yards can impact it. And there's like an analytic, analytically driven mindset with him and special teams of if we can get the ball to here or if on defense the ball is – not here yet and we're getting on the field then that really helps our chances of getting a stop or scoring points and therefore winning games and so i think that top down approach was really interesting and then i know you wrote on this specifically Jaden bright obviously he's coming over to be a receiver but they said no 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 no, no. you're not just going to be a receiver here you're going to also have to work your butt off on special teams and that's kind of interesting to see from the beginning with him how they kind of said look dude like you're not just going to play outside on offense. You're going to have to kind of get dirty and work hard on special teams if you re really want to see the field. Yeah, and I think that that's telling not just for 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 them, but him too. I mean, he's willing to do that. And, you know, Neil said something, and, and some other people have addressed this in the past, that 
you got to look at this big picture too. If you think you can play in the NFL, you know, if you're not going to be, you know, the wide receiver one or maybe the wide receiver two, you better be able to play special teams. Uh, you better be able to. Bryce Ford Whedon was about to make the Giants roster before he got hurt just because yeah, of his ability value, on special teams. I mean, on offense, better learn how to. You know, if you're not the bookend left tackle or sometimes the center, you better be able to. And most centers can play multiple positions, anyways, but you better be able to play uh, m- multiple positions because the rosters are so short. Uh, you don't have a lot of you don't have a lot of space. You don't have like a lot of wiggle room, so you need guys that have versatility. And I think that that's big ups to West Virginia and their coaching staff. You know, really focusing on kids because you know you can look at that and say, oh, well, yeah, they're they are benefiting. You know, getting some of their best players on those teams, but at the same time, you're preparing them for the next level. And I think that you know, Neil, it's the buzzword. It's been the descriptive word. He keeps talking about developmental program. And they've wanted to be one, you know, since he first got here. And that's with players. That's with coaching. And you're developing guys for the next level by doing stuff like that. And the fact that you've got players that embrace it, you know, don't shy away from it, want to do it, see the benefits. You know, Neil talks about making them understand why. And the fact that that why there's no disconnect, I think it helps West Virginia as a whole. And that's why you've really seen outside of kickoff, uh, most of the special team units here have been pretty good the last few years. Yeah, and I think for some guys, their ego can kind of get in the way and be like, oh, I'm not a special teams player, right? Or, oh, that I'm too good for special teams. And if you therefore put a guy out there that might think that way, that you're, you're a – I take a playoff away from really the game possibly changing. And so I think, as you said, that buy-in as a group, as a whole, that's really something that you could credit Neil and the staff of how – it's not just they're trying to get these freshmen who might just play. They're getting everyone top to bottom, no matter who you are, to play special teams. And that's 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 something that has helped them significantly in the past couple of years. But let's go here. We have a couple of positions uh, listed down that we're going to try and guess 13 days out who will be the starters at those positions. Let's start on offense. we got a couple spots. Let's go to offensive tackle first, obviously. Uh, Milam on the left side, but on the right side, I, I think it's going to be Nick Malone. Personally, I just think that he's been there, he's done that, and he's actually played significant steps for this team last year. And that he's an older guy, obviously, and that they can trust him. And out the gate, I think that's what they're going to go with. I agree with you. I, I think that in the spring, I felt it was going to be more of a battle, and I'm not. I'm in no way saying it's not. But I think Nick has really held that down. I think he's got the trust of the coaches. You know, he's earned this over time. And I think there's there's a plan for Xavier. He's going to fit in there. You know, they might play a little bit. He might play a little bit at different points of the season. But I think at least to open the season, that job's Nick Malone's. And I think he's earned that um, with, with what he's been able to do since he's been here. Let's go to the receiver position. We are each going to have three guys who we think will start there for this team. Obviously, it's all formation dependent, but let's go with you, Keenan, first. Who are your three guys that you've got? Today, if I had to go today, I think it would be Traylon Ray on the outside, Hudson Clement on the outside, and Preston Fox in the middle. That's who I got. I was tempted to, you know, I I really liked what Jaden Bray does, but I think that he's more of a – He'll work in there at the starting. You know, I think I like that group, those three. I think if you go four, you have, you know, depending, you can put Cole Taylor, you know, at the one of those inside receiver spots, or you could go Rodney Gallagher too, or, or you could go big, you know, the way West Virginia did last year with Devin Carter in the slot. But those are my three if I had to pick today. And I think that all three of them have earned it. They've been very reliable. And uh, I've been especially impressed with, with Preston Fox and Hudson Clement. Because, you know, those are two former walk-ons that might be might be your two best receivers right now. Might be. I, I'm a little bit different than you. I've got Traylon Ray there, and I think we really just haven't heard his name at all, which I think it's a good thing, right? Like, if, if you're one of your best receivers is just doing what he should be doing, working hard, that's a good thing. Um, I've got Hudson Clement as well. He's definitely earned it. I mean – his play speaks for itself last year, what he was able to kind of just burst onto the scene and do not just in that one game against Duquesne, but literally throughout the entire year he was there. But then I, I've got Jaden Bray. I just think that he he was brought here for a reason. And while I think that Preston Fox is a 
great receiver and he's done a lot of good things. I just think that right now Jaden Bray is is really turning heads just based off of what we're hearing. And he has that level of physicality and Big 12 experience because to, pre- to to not trying to say Preston Fox doesn't deserve it, but, I mean, he was thrown into that Penn State game last year, and there were, there were a couple plays going his way where he just couldn't really make that play just because he's not the biggest guy in the world, truthfully. And Jaden Bray kind of brings another level of physicality. He's, he's bigger. He's got the size. But if I had to go with three of them, those would be my three. And I think it's important to note that all these guys are going to play. Yes. They're going to go six to eight deep there throughout the year. And, you know, you're going to have got a lot of guys that are in similar spots. Yeah. You're going to have day day farmer in there. You're going to have Justin Robinson. You're going to have a lot of Rodney different Gallagher. Movies. He's going to work himself yes. in there. Yep. Gallagher. And like I said, you could even play Cole Taylor at one of those inside spots, depending on how you mix it around and move it. Cause he's athletic enough. So I think that there's going to be a lot of guys that play, but I, I think it'll be interesting to see how, and how much does it matter? You know, it could be personnel based, you know, they might have three guys that start the game that maybe they're running the ball on that play. Yeah, or, you know what I mean? And then they, as soon as the play's over, they say, okay, you three are off and you two are on, right? Yeah, yeah. so it's going to be interesting to see how that I, – I am excited, not just there. We touched on this earlier with kind of the secondary and stuff, just to see how the depth is used because I really do believe, like this is me saying this because I've been really apprehensive about that term since I got burned on it listening to some coaches a long time ago uh, back when Dana was here talking about depth and then the season started. Everybody was complaining about depth, so – it's, it's always that dirty word in fall camp, but I really do just by looking at this team, looking at the options they have, I feel like they have it. Now, does it come to fruition? We'll see. We mentioned this earlier, but th- they look at the receiver room, for example. Like, I, there's eight guys that could play. Maybe nine. It, it, but So, we'll see. We'll see how it all works out. Speaking of depth, another room, as we've said, that has a lot of depth, the inside linebacker room. Obviously, two spots, but there's a lot of guys to go around, a lot of mouths to feed. I think this one's kind of cut and dry for me. I think it's Josiah Trotter and Trey Lathan. I just think that when you mix experience with talent, those two guys, while Josiah Trotter isn't that experience, the talent is there. And Trey Lathan, before he got hurt last year, was was playing really, really, really good football. And so no knock to Carrico or Cutter or any of those guys, but I just think right now those are what they want. And I mean, I think nothing speaks to Trotter more than that he was going to play last year until he got hurt. The plan was for him to play, and so why not play him when he's back and healthy and a year developed and has another level of physicality under his belt because he's gotten stronger. And so those those are my two guys, Trey Lathan and Josiah Trotter at that position. Yeah, I think that, that those, that's the answer. I would be shocked if it's not the answer. But I do think that, again, that, that D word, I do think that they are allowed to – that's going to afford them the chance to actually cut down on some snaps. And, you know, Jeff Kuhn said, you know, all of his guys are going to play on some some form of special teams. So you can get maybe some more special team snaps out of those guys, and you could play, you know, Trotter and Lathan 45, 50 snaps a game instead of 80 snaps a game or 70 snaps a game and make them much more effective, especially in the second half. You know, you can mix and match because you trust Carrico, you trust Cutter, you know, you trust Beiser. The, the, those guys are proven. You know, you know that they can play. They can step in. There's not nearly the question marks there is, like we were talking about earlier with the secondary. I, I also think to that point of cutting down snaps, I think it helps guys be fresh late in the game. If they want to change things up where they have three linebackers on the field, let's say for a specific package, or if they really want to try and cook something up schematically to get after someone or to stop a specific play, you're not asking a guy who's been – worn out for the last four quarters to get in there. You're asking a guy who's more fresh because you've been able to rotate. And I think across the board, that's going to be something to keep an eye on is, I mean, let's just go to the Oklahoma state game. Right. And in the fourth quarter, it it was just, everyone felt like they were laying down and Ollie Gordon is still running past the hospital and up into, up into Pennsylvania. But yeah, like you, you're going to have opportunities where you're going to want to get these fresh legs in and then you're going to want to have, specific guys in specific spots late in the game with the game on the line. And we've talked about the competitive nature of the schedule and how it's going to be a lot of one score games most likely. And so those kind of plays and having depth so you can have who you want in there and feel good about who's in there at specific times will probably rear its head, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. And that's what you want. I mean, you, you want to get to the point where you've got guys that you can trust to go out there 
But then if something happens, if they need to be out of the game, you've got guys that you can trust to go in behind them. And if you've got that, then you start to put together a pretty good program. And that's that's how you build it. That's why it takes time. It's not an easy fix. It does take time to develop that. And you're seeing it on the offensive line. You know, I think that similar to linebacker, you know, there's probably – and receiver, there's, there's a lot of trust there with even the second team group, which I don't think that's been there in the past. One more thing before we get out of here, and you you can go first with this. Obviously, two weeks ago, two plus weeks ago, when we first started this thing, we we both talked about different areas of concern. So now, two weeks later, and a week before, two sorry, two weeks later, and still two weeks before we get going for the 2024 season. What is your still biggest question mark or thing that you're curious about as we enter the final week of fall camp? I think we've touched on it already tonight. I, I, I really do. I think it's the secondary, the safeties, you know, who is going to emerge there, who is going to prove that they're able to play behind the starters. Cause I think that that was a major issue last year. They only had a few guys that they could really trust in a game. And when one of those guys went down, it was a nightmare. So I think that who's going to emerge there, which of these transfers is going to step up and who's going to kind of make that what they needed to be uh, in order to play defense. And I think that credit to Shadon Brown, and, and his staff over there, you know, getting guys in here that that look the part and definitely can play. They've been productive at their previous stops, but can they do it at the power four level? And I think that that's where Drew Fabianich and some of those guys come into play. They do a good job with this. I don't have any doubts about that. Let's just see it. You know, let's see it play out. The fact that Neil was still talking about it as an area of concern and we're close to the season at least makes you gives you a little bit of pause. Now, that could be some motivational tactics. Trust me. These coaches like like to <laughs> kind of put that stuff out there, but I think it's something that I'm going to be watching game one. Yeah, I, I had secondary in my head too, but I'll just I'll just go a different route. Kickoff. Kickoff and kickoff return, just because we've we've heard these, these things have been put out. Like Michael Hayes kind of getting pushed here, and it seems like they're trying to just motivate him to make sure that he does exactly what they need him to do on kickoff. And then kickoff return. It seems like it's been a revolving door as of late of trying to find a name who sticks. Uh, it seems like Hudson Clements kind of got that, but they've given multiple guys opportunities because it seems like they're really trying to focus and find a way to have success on kickoff return and give themselves a chance to set up field position. And we've talked about special teams a bunch, especially tonight here of just they, they know special teams is important and it's a matter of can they – do well enough on special teams to make it mean something when the lights are bright. And so kickoff and kickoff return for me is my big thing. So, and I think that's a good one. I think that's a good one. (laughs) It really should have been at the top of my list too. I mean, we all remember what happened last year. I mean, uh, yeah. And, and what's the, what's going to start this game one way or another at Penn state. It's, it's going to be a kickoff one way or another. So we'll, we'll see uh, very quickly, but 13 days away from kickoff, and we are excited, just as I know all of you guys who are listening are. So whether you are watching or listening, we do appreciate you tuning in. Uh, We will have more content throughout the week on WestVirginiaSports.com as we are closing in. It's starting starting to get real, Keenan. you got week zero. you got fantasy football drive. we got it it all going on. Uh, Fall is Fall is fastly approaching, and we appreciate you guys sticking with us. So for myself, Wesley Shoemaker, joined by the one and only Keenan Cummings, this is the WestVirginiaSports.com, and thank you for listening.